Big 12 football, huge weekend. And I think one of the more interesting talking points on the Big 12 right now is the idea that BYU is going to lose a game. And I was looking at um, the old ESPN machine and their FPI, which is the football power index, measures a team's true strength on net point scale, expected point margin versus average opponents on a neutral field. And if you use that ranking, BYU is not only not number one in the conference, they are fourth in the conference behind K-State, Colorado, Iowa State, then BYU. Jake, is it disrespectful to have them fourth by ESPN in their in their Big 12 power index? I mean, I I, I think that, uh, you know, obviously it's a, it's a, it's a formula that they've put together to measure, you know, a team's ability in some form or fashion. And it's so a it's good not, one. Yeah. And it, so, you know, is it disrespectful by ESPN? I don't think anyone's saying that BYU is not the best team in, in, in the conference as their opinion, but clearly the formula is saying that they're not. And, you know, clearly the formula is saying that there's more confidence in those other teams you mentioned versus BYU. And I think part of that is BYU's, you know, style of play you know byu likes to play um you know interesting games sometimes you know certain games this season have been much closer than they probably should have been i think people generally speaking don't have confidence that byu can put teams away uh and and that byu is this team that's just going to be you know you know torching you by three or four touchdowns like that's not who byu has been typically you know it's a pretty close game going to the half and then they'll pull away from you in the second half like yeah that's kind of who they've been so you know, it doesn't surprise me that that the FPI has it has it laid out like this. But you look at that um, the column, see power index, but then you go right next to it. Projected wins and losses. They have BYU losing as many as two games, but a minimum of one. They have them losing one point six of their remaining three games. And I know that we talk about this on a regular basis. We've beat this topic into the ground. But before we get into the power rankings, do you believe that BYU can run the table? I think it is a it is a, a big question, and I know that it, I feel like we talk about it every day. I am not conf- I am terrified of these next two games. I think this game with Kansas this weekend, BYU is only favored by two and a half points. the The consensus number in Vegas is two and a half points at home. 8.15 on a Saturday night on ESPN. And BYU's only favored by two and a half points. Yeah, I mean, I think clearly they're, they're saying that this is going to be a, a trap game of sorts for BYU. You know, basically, you escaped Utah. You know, yeah. all the drama with that, everything we've talked about with it. Uh, and now it would be easy to, you know, have a home game at Lavelle at night against a Big 12 team that maybe isn't the best they've ever been this year. Um, you know, and it would be easy to have a trap game, but but I'm not concerned about this game. It's a home game. It's at night. It's at Lavelle. Uh, it's going to be awful weather. It's going to be really cold. Uh, I, I, I would expect BYU to to come out uh, and do their job. And, and we're, we're, to me, with this team, we're well past wondering, can they beat Big 12 opposition at Lavelle at night? I think they've shown that repeatedly. Uh, I, yeah. and, and I also think that things like, you know, the FPI don't take into account, you know, BYU's uh, defensive ability to create plays and, and sort of create shock value for the opposition. You know, creating those turnovers, um, you know, rocking the boat. Like, I, I think we see that pretty regularly. But you've also had several near misses for this BYU team. And you look at the Utah game, you look at the Oak State game, you, you, you kind of go down the schedule. And this this BYU team tends to put itself in spots against SMU on the road. Okay, that was on the road. Your first real test found a way to win the game. Good with that. Um, you dominate Wyoming and K State. You play a a game probably at Baylor that shouldn't have been that close. That was one of the Kalani's being nice games, right? Thirty four twenty eight. Then the Oak State game happened, and you just couldn't execute until you really needed to execute and Darius Lasseter caught that touchdown. Then you play the Utah game and you didn't execute against the best defense in the conference, obviously. 
but you found a way to win that game. Are you are you at all concerned that BYU tends to to live uh, on the the razor's edge, if you will? I mean, I, I, that's definitely a concern. I mean, I I, I think the the it, it really comes down to how you want to look at this. I, I, I mean, you can easily look at it just like you just laid out there, saying, "Hey, like they've played a lot of close games where you know they should have beat this team or that team." Yeah, you know, by a couple of touchdowns or whatever, and it stayed close, like. Like Ollie Gordon ran all over them and he hasn't run all over anybody this year. Like, you know, there are several of those storylines in this season. You know, the other way you could also look at it, in my opinion, and this is how I think BYU fan wants to look at it is, hey, like as part of an undefeated season, you're going to have games that are close and we found a way to win the game. So I have all the confidence in the world of my team, you know, and and so for me, I look at it and I say, yeah, I, I think this this BYU team can beat anybody in the Big 12 on any given Saturday, if you will. I think they're talented. They play well. I would agree that they are not um, as cold-blooded as I would like them to be. They are not as savage as I would like them to be. I'd love to see them, you know, um, demoralize teams a little bit more. I'd love to see more of the K-State game energy. The Arizona out, game. The Arizona, not the Arizona game. game, obviously. Yeah, like, you know, you, you need some more of that. And I think with Kansas specifically, like, Kansas is a team that has to run the ball to have success. They have to have the run game. And so, you know, if you allow them to, to run on you the way you allowed Oak state to run on you, uh, you know, that's going to be a, a, a tight game. But again, I have to say, I don't believe that that Kansas is going to be able to run for, you know, 120, 150 on BYU's defense. I just, I don't, I don't see that taking place at night at, at Lavelle they in average, those conditions. They average 214 yards a game on the ground. And I agree that you have to, if they break 150 yards, this game's going to be very, very close because BYU does not run the ball uh, well enough, in my opinion. They only average 163 yards, which is bottom half of the Big 12. Uh, and the uh, number two rushing attack in the in the league, Kansas Jayhawks. And it's because Jalen's a really good quarterback that can move the football. I think it's going to be a really good game. Um, and I, I, I start off this conversation about Big 12 power rankings with that. Um, because I am not at all confident that BYU is going to run the table and be undefeated. And these next two weeks are really going to show us about this football team because I think you look at this Kansas matchup, that's 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 terrifying to me because let's 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 go through who's the worst team in the Big 12 right now. Let's do Big 12 power mm. rankings. Who do you think who do you think is the worst team? in the Big 12. I think that's really difficult. Yeah, I mean, I think the the problem and this is kind of what we we've we been talking about recently with the Big 12 is that, you know, there's so much inconsistency. You know, you could easily point to you could easily point to Oak State or you could easily point to, you know, uh, you know, really any of those bottom feeder teams in the Big 12, but you know, to me it's like I, I when I look at who the worst team in a conference is, I, I take into account, okay, what kind of football you're playing now, but also what were the expectations? You know, because again, I'm a big believer as you go through football season. Yeah, hey, maybe maybe you got off to a really slow start and that cost you your season, but now you're playing awesome football and you're the team we wanted you to be, which is exactly not what Oak State is doing. And, mm. and so that's why I say like, I still think Oak State is there. Um, I think that UCF has had a pretty massive fall off here where, where you know, you were expecting them with KJ Jefferson early in the year to be like this mid-level, you know, push to the top four teams in the Big 12. I think they're uh, a, a really disappointing team this year and playing some of their worst football. Arizona? So, yeah, Arizona's, uh, you know, here's the problem with Arizona. Everyone in the, in the preseason polls early in the season was like, oh, Arizona's going to be a top three team in this league. And we told you that we didn't we didn't really understand how that mapped, if you will. We didn't really understand how that added up, how that works. <laughs> we did. Um, and and you know they have some nice moments. You know, uh, Tedero McMillan and, and and the boys, Fafita and the boys are 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 good offense. But the reality is, like when you played BYU versus how other teams played BYU, it wasn't all that close. Like it just wasn't. their defense is not good. Yeah, their defense is yeah. is not good at all. And. You start looking at some of the defensive numbers and um, you start looking at where Arizona is. They're 13th in this league in rushing defense. Um, they are eighth in the league in uh, pass defense and they're 14th in total defense. They're not, they're not good uh, defensively. I actually, 
Um, I actually sit here and tell you, I think Arizona is the worst team in the league. I think that is the, if I were, if I were ranking the five worst teams, um, I think that I would probably, and the numbers are really close. And you know, if you've watched the show at all, you know, I'm a big believer in metrics. I think metrics really paint the picture and, and usually your performance on the field is, is substantial substantially based on your metrics Mm -hmm. and I think right now I would have to go Arizona the worst team Oak State right behind them Um, I think Houston I think man I, I I think then you probably go Utah and who's better Baylor or or West Virginia I, mean, I think that's a very close I, you that's know, the, really close. You know, I think the best way to answer that question is to ask who they're playing on any given week. You know, I think Baylor and West Virginia are 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 pretty similar in the sense that, you know, they don't really have explosive offense and their defenses are inconsistent. Some weeks West Virginia's defense is pretty damn good. Yeah. You know, and other weeks it's 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 not as good as you'd like it to be. And and I'd say the same thing uh about Baylor. And I and I think you know, again, when we talk about expectations and the way a season's gone, like I, I, you can't run from the fact, you can't shy away from the fact that you know I do think the Utes are in the bottom five of the conference. No question, I, 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 they're your no one question. win team. You you've scored ninety three points and given up one hundred and twenty one. I mean, that's just not at all in any way, shape, or form a good ratio. And you know, when you when you start to look at you know running backs getting in the portal and you know, different, you know, the Isaac Wilson situation. Like, it's just not a good time at Utah right now. So, for me, it's, for me, Oklahoma State's still the worst team in the conference. I, I, that I, that defense is terrible. You haven't won a game in conference. You know, you're, you're, you're 0 7 in conference. Like, it's just not, I, I would say Oklahoma State, Arizona, uh, I would go UCF and then I would go Utah after that. Cause at least with Utah, can't argue with that. You know, at least with Utah, I can say, hey, you've got, you know, Based on the BYU game, you've got the best defense yeah, in the league. I, I don't see UCF being in the bottom five. I, I think that when you have that kind of offense, it's why Tech is not in the bottom five because they have a, a tremendous offense. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I really if if we look at if we look at, if you just go based on standings, I mean, you would say Oak State and Utah, but right. I think Utah's better than Arizona. Uh, I think. Again, I think Arizona and Oak State, let them have an argument over who the worst team is. Agreed. I agree completely. Right. Yeah. I, I think I would put Arizona in the bottom, Oak State second. Um, I think I I want to say Houston, but Houston's I mean, can you put Houston behind or below Utah? No. I don't can't. think you can right now. No. So yeah, me I think you, that's a really good point. I think I would go Arizona. Oak State, Utah, Houston would be right there. And then, you know, I think probably UCF or Kansas. Mm-hmm. And I think UCF is better than Kansas. And I think right now it's teams like Baylor, Cincinnati Tech, and TCU, and I throw West Virginia in, in there, are all just the middle of the conference. They're not great teams. They're not yeah, they're there not is the a worst huge, team. But, there you know. is a huge pack at three and four wins. Yeah. The four-win pack of Iowa State, K-State, Arizona State, West Virginia, TCU, and Tech, there's not a whole lot that separates those teams. Mm-hmm. Iowa State, I think, is going to be the best of that bunch, mainly because of their defense. Uh, and I still, it, you know, if you ask me today, would I take Rocco back to Avery Johnson? Well, I'm going to take Rocco back because I think Rocco can throw me to a win if I need him to. So I think that group, I think the top of this conference is a much bigger conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think if if people are going to automatically go with, well, I'm taking uh, BYU as the best, Monty. Well, I I think, and this is going to shock people, I think Colorado is the best team in the conference. Right now, if you said to me, who do you think will win the Big 12 championship? The Colorado Buffaloes. Why do you say? I hate the matchup for BYU. If you put Colorado and BYU on the same field in, in, in at AT and T Stadium, I have a hard time seeing BYU winning that game. I well, I think the firepower outside for um, for Colorado that worries me. But what el- what also worries me is 
Shador Sanders is no longer making the stupid mistake. He's no longer making the panic mistake. He's getting that extra second and a half to throw the football. And they've got three wide receivers that just absolutely eat. Right. And I think the other thing that worries me is BYU's offense has become a little less explosive, a little less down the field, over the top, and a lot more underneath plotting methodical offense. I think the play calling at Colorado, I I, I think it's been elite. I think their their inability to run the football has largely been mitigated by the fact that they don't need to run the football to win. Well, and you see him throw a lot of one, two yard stuff. Yes. You know, that kind of replaces that. Yes. Uh, the matchup terrifies me, terrifies me for BYU as a, as somebody that watches a ton of both of those football teams. I think that there are times where this BYU offense is just confounding. But I think, you know, something that's interesting about these two teams that I think is a classic perception versus reality thing or item is when you look at points for points against, because I'm a big believer in that for football teams. Like if you're scoring a lot of points and not giving a lot up, that's going to show up. Obviously BYU's points for is 210 points against is 136. Colorado's points for uh, is 223 points against is 140. So a few more points, another touchdown or two. And basically the same amount of points allowed as rough as they looked earlier in the year. Right. So like, obviously I would agree. Colorado's has a much more explosive offense, but it's not as though BYU's not scoring points. And so it comes down to, again, what I keep saying, I don't mean to be repetitive, but it is the day of the game who who's playing better football that day. I mean, I could easily see it being Colorado. I could also just as easily see it being BYU's defense turning Shador Sanders over. I know he's not making the mistake, but they've shown an ability to put quarterbacks in precarious situations and force them to pick the lesser of two evils, and that typically re results in a, in a turnover. But so has Colorado's defense. I, it's shocking. They're the seventh defense in the conference right now, and – they're ahead of the Arizona States, the Kansases. The, they are very close to Cincinnati and Houston, whose defense, I, I don't think many people realize how good Houston's defense is. And I've been preaching that all season long. Houston's defense is really good. Colorado um, is just behind Houston. And Colorado at 22.6 points a game is only three points behind BYU, who is third in the conference. That's how tight the, the top half of this conference defensively is. And Colorado is actually playing really solid defense. And I know it's crazy, but obviously BYU, it, I think, is a better defensive team. The point differential is significant. You've given up 25 less points than Colorado. That is significant. I think this would be a very good game. And the thing that worries you is BYU, whether it was the Baylor game, the Oak State game, they just tend to lapse. They tend to take drives off. And Colorado will absolutely execute you if you do that. Mm -hmm. They will, they will, they will shell shock you and it will be quick. So I I worry a little bit about that matchup. I I think I would right now take Colorado as the best team in the league. The way they're playing right now on November 14th, I think I have to take Colorado as the best team. Yeah, and and I, I you know, I, I can't say that that's entirely wrong. You know, I, I think BYU fan, I'm sure, is going to freak out about that. But I, I, I don't think that, you know, if you watch Colorado on the road against Tech, you saw a team that was just better. Like, it wasn't really all that close. And it's not like Tech is a horrible team. Uh, you know, to me, they're not in the worst team in the league conf uh, conversation, but no. they're definitely like mid-pack. And, you know, some weeks, Baron Morton in that offense scores 40, and other weeks, it's 20. <laughs> and against Colorado, I think, what was it, 27 or whatever they had, or 21. Or the problem is the offense in, in Lubbock doesn't have the ability to dictate the pace of the game. Because the defense is so bad. Yeah. And so you're constantly in flux with your offensive game plan. Your play calling is determined by, by how bad the defense is that day. And you can't run an offense that way. You 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 simply cannot. It's it's it is basic X's and O's in, in football that I think you you look at this league 
And I think when I look at who the best teams in this league are, I think I would go Colorado one. I think I would go BYU two. I think I would go, and this is the one like Iowa State, K-State. We're going to find out. I think I'd take Iowa State over K-State in a very close matchup because of the quarterbacks. Agreed. And so, the defense. I, and, and I think that Cincinnati's the fifth best team in the league. And I, which is really surprising. I think what Scott Satterfield has done at, at Cincinnati has been nothing short of miraculous. And I think that I'm really impressed with the way that Cincinnati has operated. Now, again, are they a four win team? They're not. And I know that that's surprising and you guys are going to tell me I'm crazy, but Cincinnati's better than Texas tech. I think they're better than TCU West Virginia. Um, And then it's Arizona State and Texas Tech. Or Arizona State and Cincinnati, excuse me. And I say to myself, I I, I look at the the schematics at Cincinnati. They don't do anything accidentally. And I really have a lot of, I have a lot of respect for that. They're they're one of the top 10 teams. They're in the top half defensively at six. Um, They are, I wish they scored more points. They, I think to be one of the best teams in this league, you have to score 30 points. They do not. Yeah. And that's, that's why I would tend to lean Arizona state over Cincinnati. I I, I don't disagree with anything you've said about Cincinnati, about how, you know, they're doing a great job. Um, You know, Scott Satterfield's got them going in the right direction for sure. Um, I am just partial to Dillingham's style and his energy and the way his team plays football. And he loves to punch you in the face. Yeah, and now you're getting Scadabo back. Um, they, I, I, I'm also a big believer, especially in the Big 12, that injury management's a big deal. And he did a great job, Dillingham did, of keeping Scadabo out last week. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if you guys saw the video, but Scadabo's literally in, in, you know, in street clothes, if you will, in their huddle uh, during a timeout asking Dillingham if he can go suit up. And Dillingham was like, no, you're not. And, and that just kind of tells you like the, these are dudes who want to play for this guy and, and are willing to do whatever it takes. And so I, I, I would say for me, you know, I, uh, my top five, I, I would put BYU number one just because you haven't lost. And, and I understand you, some of these wins haven't been sexy and, you yeah. know, they haven't been great, but you're still undefeated. So I got to give you the nod there. But then, yeah, I would be I would be Colorado. Um, I, I, I think then you got to go after that. I'd be Iowa State, K-State and Arizona State. I think those are the those three are are kind of to me in the same. But I think there's a huge fall off after four four. Yeah. For like everybody else is wildly inconsistent. Mm-hmm. I think you put any of any of those top four teams on the field, they're gonna win the game. Nine, ten, nine weeks out of ten. Arizona State, I don't think I can put them in that grouping. If Scadabo is healthy, they control the clock much better. Mm-hmm. So okay, sure. But I look at, like, Cincinnati is a great example. Cincinnati, Kansas, West Virginia, how how much separation is there? Uh, There's not a whole lot of separation there. I think, I think you're right. I would, I think I would go Colorado, BYU, Mm -hmm. Iowa, K-State, Arizona State. Yeah. Thinking through the, thinking through numbers and the eye test and I think everybody below that is that, Cincinnati can beat every team. West Virginia's. I, I just ask me what their offense looks like that week. Um, I I, I kind of look at Baylor. Baylor to me, you want to know the story of Baylor's season, is that I I think Baylor should be much better defensively than they are, and they're just not good enough defensively. And your head coach is a defensive guy, mm-hmm. and. I think I look at at Baylor offensively. Baylor can can play with anybody in this league offensively. They they are they're really good. They do th- good things. Their defense just isn't good enough. I look at somebody like West Virginia. The story with West Virginia is they're not good defensively and they're not good offensively. They're not bad defensively. They're not bad offensively. They just don't have an identity. Right? And it's what's allowed Houston to climb the ladder so quickly this year and win games 
because you have so many teams that are just vanilla on both sides of the ball. And then you have teams like Tech and, and Utah who are so lopsided in one direction or the other. There's just no separation after the top four spots in this league. And I think it's why they'll only get one team in unless Colorado wins the Big 12 championship game Yeah, against a, an undefeated BYU. Then I think you'll get two teams in. But I I think this league is just so plotting and methodical most weekends. Yeah. You and know, then, like there's a lot of times where that plotting and methodical is mixed in with terrible mistakes and just bad play. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And, and, and and so then you've got this situation where, you know, again, unfortunately for BYU in Colorado, I I know for a fact people nationally ask, hey, like, you know, look at the competition they're playing. Like BYU's got great strength of schedule you know, comparatively. Yeah. But there are some of those teams on there that you're looking at. You're like, man, like Oak State's just not a good team. And BYU struggled to beat them, you know, or like who, ba- whoever Baylor, you want to look at. Baylor is the perfect example of this in this conference. Yeah. Baylor should be a much better football team, but their defense is killing them. And they don't want to fire eight ball because, well, he's this really quality guy. He's a defensive guru, apparently. Now, I haven't seen that at Baylor, and you fired the offensive guys, and it was Grimes' fault. Baylor is quintessential Big 12 mediocrity, right? in my opinion. And, you know, at least with Joey, you can make excuses about he's a high school guy. He's coming along. Look at the elite offense. Okay. What is your excuse for Dave Aranda at Baylor? Your offense is doing well. Your defense is not doing well. Or... I mean, you can look at the the bot like Arizona coaching change. They miss Jed Fish. Period. That's it. That's the whole conversation, right? Uh, Oak State, you need a massive change in culture there. Like, there's a story to be written. Houston, Willie Fritz is building something on the in, in the right direction. But I look at UCF, you're probably looking at a coaching change. Yeah. You have one of the best, and now you've found your quarterback. You have one of the best running backs in the country, the second best back in the conference. But, but look at but look at that storyline. That is perfect example of Big Twelve football. UCF was supposed to be this team that was like, hey, they're going to way overachieve this year again. And, and this is what everybody was saying, and it's not what's played out, but what everyone thought was, hey, Gus has that team going in the right direction. You've got R.J. Harvey, you've got K.J. Jefferson. You know, that defense should be improved a little bit. Not a great defense, but a defense that at least can kind of hold their own a little bit. Um, and and this is a team that that theoretically should be playing high scoring games with a lot of volatility. You know, you're you're gonna be playing 35, 31, you know, 38, 35 kind of football. And you're gonna do that with a gunslinger or quarterback. So theoretically, you should be able to get over the hump. And that just has not worked out in any way, shape, or form hasn't been good, and you've spent several weeks trying to figure out who your quarterback is, which brings us to what you just said. You finally have your quarterback, and the season's almost over. And again, (laughs) and again, um, I just will say, defense wins you championships. Do you have to have an offense? You do. In this league, you, you look at defense as being critical but you have to be able to score points. Who's given up the fewest touchdowns in the Big 12 this year? It's Utah. You, but Utah can't score. And it, if I said to you, Utah is is the second, has scored the second least amount of touchdowns on offense. Nobody would be surprised by Nobody that. Nobody would be surprised by that, but it's why you're not winning games. So I, I anyway, that's why I say, I think you look at the, the teams at the top of this Big 12 that are really good, BYU has only given up 21 touchdowns. They've scored 31 touchdowns. Cincinnati has only given up 20 touchdowns. It's pretty good, man. Iowa State has only given up 20 touchdowns. You have to have good defense, really good defense. But the team that stands out to you again in these numbers is Colorado scored 35 touchdowns and only given up 24. It's why they're winning games. They have a solid defense and a spectacular offense. Mm-hmm. Who do you guys think in the comment section is the best team in the Big 12? Is it BYU? I- am I crazy for saying Colorado is the best football team in the Big 12? Here on November 14th. 
I don't think you're crazy for that. I, I I think again the question of who's playing the best football right now. Colorado is playing really good football right now, and and they they look prepared. Like I I'm telling you the the and I know again it's Lubbock. It's not like you know hundred thousand seat stadium, crazy SEC environment. I understand that, but they can only play who's in front of them, and that that environment they weren't shook at all. If anything, Texas Tech was the squad that was not doing well. They were not shook, but again, <laughs> like. Texas is where Dion. That's Dion's home. That's Shador's home. That's those are Texans, and I don't know that a lot of people understand that. Those guys are Texas dudes. So when we talk about going to Texas, great. You, Dion Sanders. There's no circus that's going to be too big for Colorado. There's no tent that they they are the circus. Yeah, they are the chaos. Yeah. And they, that's, they're always in chaos, but I feel like they've learned how to, how to, how to use that now. Like it yes. like last year was like, Oh man, all like you remember last year, all the celebrities were showing up. And it, was, it was more of a show than kind of a, a, a football game. Kids were lining up outside the stadium and now, camping. Yeah. And- now, now it's more like, Hey, some of that stuff still goes on, but we're here to do a job. We're here to play football. And as part of that process, we get, you know, the kids camping outside and bigger names showing up. It's it, it's kind of been a, a switch they've made. And and I think they 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 do a great job of that. And I think that it's it's a very underrated skill that Dion has. Everyone wants to criticize Dion for his style and like the flashiness and the you know what what a lot of people would say it would be like the in your faceness about their program. And I'm just sitting here saying like Dion's always been that way. This isn't always. new out of Dion. This isn't like, oh hey. He got the Colorado job, so now he thinks he's sliced bread. Like, this guy's always been flashy. And now, the problem is, for the opposition, Dion's learned how to harness that power, not for himself, but through his players. Yeah. And now, the problem is, is that when you go to 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 Boulder, that's turned into a really good home field advantage for them. So when they go out on the road and play Texas Tech in a warm weather game uh, at sea level, they're not having any type of problems that they, I can't express how relaxed and how chill they were in that game. Like, like even with the ball boy incident, sure. Sure. Didn't lose himself in that moment. No, he was just, he was just handling it. So I just, I, I don't think you're crazy for saying Colorado is, is potentially the best team in this league. I, I might I, go as far as to even say they're the most ready team in this league. Yeah, I think ready to handle a big moment. Yeah, I would say Colorado. I I would say that is something Colorado has over BYU. I think BYU, you know, um, like in the Utah game, early in the Utah game, BYU was not executing well. Like you you got, you know, you got false starts. You got um, some penalties there. And, you know, I feel like there have been times where BYU just isn't quite, you know, just not quite prepared enough in terms of handling the moment, not losing your composure, going out on that first drive and executing. Like, how many times are we going to watch a big-time SEC matchup? Like like the Bama-LSU game where, you know, you you come out, you know, you drive down the field, score that touchdown, and basically take control of that game early if you're Alabama, right? Like, that was huge, you know? We see that week in and week out in the SEC because the environment is so crazy, but these teams are so prepared. So I think when I look at Colorado and BYU, yeah, I, I like the football BYU is playing overall. You know, obviously the Holy War is its own beast, but outside of that, they've played pretty good football. I just would be curious to see, like, if these two matched up, who would be more prepared in that moment? Who would be who would be the team that gets off to the faster start? It's hard to say, and it's hard to deny that it wouldn't be Colorado. It's hard to, to it's hard to, feel to say like, that. It's yeah, it's hard to feel like oh, man, I agree Colorado, with that. Colorado would get off to a slow start against BYU in the Big Twelve Championship game. I I have a really hard time with that. Yeah, and I, I just I, – I also think that Jay Hill has this defense at BYU always ready to go. Jay Hill, the defensive coordinator at BYU, always has this defense ready to go. It is – my questions for BYU will remain until he answers the questions. Is Aaron Roderick a, a national championship caliber offensive coordinator? And yeah, I'm not ready to say that. I don't, I don't, and I don't think anybody who watches this football team can say that. I, I, like, again, I, he's done enough to win ballgames. I'm not taking Absolutely. anything away from the undefeated portion of the conversation, 
But within the undefeated portion of the conversation, there are multiple times where, like, we've talked about, hey, dumb trickery play call turned into a turnover that turned into a bunch of momentum for the opposition yes. that you had to overcome. Yes. Or, hey, you called a bunch of conservative east to west play calling and wondering why you're behind the sticks. Like, Who are you, Shane Waldron? Exactly, right? Like, uh, so when you say, is he is he a... a Let's stop even asking national championship. Like I, I, I just think let's start asking. You know, can he beat the best teams that he sees? Can he go out and and in a big moment call the right play? Yeah. Like I think that's a big question. Yeah, I think it'll be very interesting to see how you go about. You know this this game with Kansas is a big deal. I, I am. I think there's real question about why BYU is only a two and a half point home favorite because I. I have trouble believing that Kansas can roll into an 815 kickoff at 4,500 feet and uh, at 32 degrees in the mountains. And the thing that people don't understand, and obviously I live here, um, the thing that people don't understand is cold air at elevation, it's really hard to breathe. Yeah. It is, it is constricting to your lungs. It is, you are going to have trouble processing oxygen. If you are Kansas, I would, and I don't, I don't know what their travel schedule is. If I was playing BYU on, on a Saturday night in Provo in November, I would be there on Thursday. I would be, I would arrive on Wednesday night and I would be practicing Thursday, Friday, and I would be running on th Thursday. If I were Kansas, I would be full pads practicing and I would be running ladders mm -hmm. to get myself prepared for Saturday night. Because your lungs will, in in reality, your lungs will bleed on Saturday night. And then you take a hit. You have a Glasker coming through the hole and popping you. You're not getting your up from that. Your willingness to get back up is not good. Your want to. <laughs> your want to goes, goes right out the door. And I think it's a huge home field advantage. It's Death Valley yes. for LSU at night. Night games at 32 degrees. And listen, Kansas City's cold. I totally get it. Lawrence, Kansas, trust me. It's different, I have dude. been there in, in the middle of, of winter for college basketball. I'm telling you, it's not close to the conditions in Provo. It is conditions in, in, at altitude at 32 degrees, which is what the kickoff forecast is. Crystal clear and 32 degrees. It's going to be cold. And it's going to be tough to breathe if you're Kansas. And if Kansas wins this game, this will be one of the truly character-building wins you've ever had as a football team. Because this is not going to be easy. Less of us, more of you. On the Monty Show, the comments section, as always, presented by our good friends at Prize Picks. I mean, you guys. I don't know how many more ways I can tell you about my genius, about my sex appeal about my intelligence, my manhood. <laughs> or we could just tell you I went on prize picks last night. Yeah, you know. the, the drought is over. Um, and mainly it's because of the Los Angeles Lakers. And I would just like to take this moment and thank LeBron James for just being an absolute pimp slapping stud mm -hmm. uh, because what he did to Memphis is a felony in many states. Right. LeBron James last night, and you guys know in the NBA, I only play points, rebounds, and assists. LeBron James last night had a 33 and a half point, point rebound and assist number on prize picks. Not only did Labrum James have a triple-double last night? He had 35, 14, and 12. I said 35 points. 14 dimes. Do some math. 35 and 14, 49. And then you had 12 on top of that. Bros, he had a 61-point rebound and assist night. F around and find out. Bro. At his, I think he is, he just turned 74, which means he's now old enough to run for president. Um, n n nothing? Okay. No. Nope. Um, I, what he, what LeBron's doing at this age is, is remarkable. Um, and then I would also like to thank, um, 
a, a, a guy that I think is much maligned on this show because Jake hates me. Uh, Carl Anthony. the way. No. <laughs> Don't start. Carl Anthony Towns, my guy with the New York Knicks, who somehow lost to the Chicago Bulls last night. Yeah, the Knicks are going to nick. Carl Anthony Towns, 28 and a half points, rebounds, and assists. Um, he put up a 59, 46 points, three dimes, 10 boards. Like, what a performance. What an absolute, unbelievable performance. And again, I, I am, I don't know if shocked is the word. I am shocked at how bad the Knicks are. I, I am shocked at how bad the Knicks are. And I, I don't even know how you explain it, but. It, the only thing more shocking is that the Cleveland Cavaliers are 13 and 0 and my guy Donovan Mitchell last night This is a guy who had a 26 and a half point point rebound and assist number. You need to pump those numbers up. Those are rookie numbers. Uh 23 points, 13 rebounds, 9 dimes. It's well done by him, bro. $80 winner right here. It's super easy. Download the Prize Picks app. Use the promo code Monty. Deposit five dollars in a new Prize Picks account. They'll give you fifty dollars more instantly. Just play a three pick flex play. That's all you have to do. What does that mean? You take LeBron, Cat, and Donovan Mitchell. You only need two of those three, right, to be good selections to win on two of those three. You get paid a Prize Picks. Football, basketball, baseball. The NBA is phenomenal. College basketball in the pooper for Cooper every single night. Bet the over on <laughs> get in the pooper for Cooper because I'm telling you, you're going to win if you do that. Um, welcome to the nightmare. I win. Google me. You know, yeah. And yeah. I, I do it so hard. Oh, I win. Google me. I do it. I do it so. Um, okay. 